So if you took a course in literary theory at the undergraduate level, um, chances are you were assigned to read Michel Foucault's What is an Author? may be paired with Roland Barthes' The Death of the Author. Um, and yet it would be incorrect to think that those two texts are basically just variations on the same theme. On the contrary, I think Roland Barthes' argument uh, that, you know, when there's a specific voice of uh, saying something at the omniscient narrator level in the story Sarrasine by Balzac, which he uses as the example, he asks the question, well, who exactly is that speaking? Is it somebody in the room? Is it the voice of God? Is it the empirical biographical figure Balzac? Or is it really just a voice within a text that should be examined? And therefore, maybe what you conclude about what it says might even transcend the intentions of the author. Maybe it is not so much a simple expression of the author's intent as it is a voice which uh, might have meanings deducible which go beyond even the author's uh, design for it. And that's a pretty, I think, easy to grasp argument, especially if it's your first text that you're reading this semester. And yet, I've seen, uh, when I was taking the course, for example, the temptation to think that Foucault is making that argument, whereas his argument is qu quite more complex than that. Uh, I remember being assigned this um, text over eight years ago, and the professor said, go home and spend uh, six hours reading Foucault because he's uh, that complicated in comparison. I reread the uh, text a number of times over, over the past eight years, and I decided to reread it again last night and do a video with uh, some general ideas outlined on the board uh, to talk about it. So, Michel Foucault is not interested in simply proclaiming the death of the author any more than he finds uh, just repeating Nietzsche's death of God to be a final fact, in that even if you try to take the, the modern approach and focus your criticism simply on the work, um, a number of problematic issues will still remain to sort of take the place of what you thought you were getting away with by disregarding the primacy of, say, the empirical or biographical facts of the author uh, as a person. For example, how can you really define canon without retaining some tacit acceptance of author, right? Um, if you think the Marquis de Sade is simply a madman in prison, um, his, his, his work isn't really work. It's more like the scribblings of a madman on a piece of paper. Um, but when he's dignified with the title of being an author, whether you explicitly say so or not, suddenly that body of scribblings become work, right? How difficult is it to um, try to canonize all of the works of Nietzsche, even if you're trying to just focus on the work? Do you include the published works, obviously. Do you include the unpublished works that are philosophical? Probably. Uh, actually, definitely you include that. Do you include the rough drafts? And at what point do you stop including rough drafts? Kind of like um, archives of the Beatles where you have so many demos, um, many of which are redundant, but some of which are quite unique that count as rough drafts that are distinct from the, the final version that made it onto the album. At what point do you, um, do you draw the line? And more importantly, is a shopping list or a letter written uh, in modern context, we would say, does every email have an author, right? And he said, the difficulty is, even if you try to get away from the empirical characteristics of the author, for example, the uh, biographical, accidental features of the life of Shakespeare, etc., and simply focus on the work, you retain a certain transcendental anonymity um, that those empirical characteristics are merely transposed into. Uh, the quote goes, In current usage, however, the notion of writing seems to transpose the empirical characteristics of the author into a transcendental anonymity. We are content to efface the more visible marks of the author's empiricity by playing off one against another two ways of characterizing writing, namely the critical and the religious approaches. Um, the religious notion or approach to texts that had developed over the ages of looking for hidden meanings, right, um, in, say, uh, your interpretation of biblical prophecy, um, the unconventional ways that Old Testament prophecy are interpreted by someone like, say, John Calvin to reinforce 
um, his own understandings, not only of the New Testament, but of his situation in the uh, early modern era, um, thousands of years later, can't, uh, relies on a, a certain approach to the text as containing those hidden meanings, which we still retain, even if we get away from the author. And then the critical approach of dealing with obscure con uh, contents within the text by providing commentary. In fact, that is the, the necessity of, uh, of commentary stems precisely from that feature. And these retain a certain sense of the author as um, continuing to exist as a, as a transcendental, that meaning the same way that Kant talked about uh, the, the transcendental features of space and time, not space and time as properties of the world as it really exists so much as they are ways of the human subject processing content in spatial and in temporal frameworks that therefore transcend go beyond the properties of reality but still provide the framework that's kind of what we're doing with the author we get away from that idea of the author but hitting meanings and obscure contents still sort of presuppose a, a similar approach so therefore he asks what is it about using an author's name um, that is different from using a simple proper name. So he invokes the work of analytic philosopher Searle to talk about the way that, contrary to the way it was it used to be thought of, a proper name is not even a simple reference. So even for say um, Bertrand Russell, the idea that um, <clears throat> Galileo is a designation who uh, cannot help but designate a guy, but there are other things that seem like naming conventions which are really not designations, they're descriptions. If you say like um, the writer of Romeo and Juliet, that is um, not a simple designation of that guy named William Shakespeare, it's actually a description uh, for which you can deduce a truth value is either true or false that this uh, property, um, this uh, predicate of having written that work can be attributed to that person. For Searle, it, the um, theory has become a little more advanced. Now, it's that using a proper name like Aristotle really is both a designation and a description. It's, it kind of hovers between the two. For example, Aristotle, in, in certain sense, designates a guy who lived in ancient Greece, but it also provides a description, such as the author of the analytics, the founder of ontology, etc. Therefore, the author's name does in a certain sense fit into that, and yet there are differences. For example, to say that some guy named Pierre Dupont does not have blue eyes or was not born in Paris or is not a doctor, if you have those conclusions, the name Pierre Dupont still refers to the same guy. We just have different biographical data on him, but the name still refers to the same guy. However, if you change some data about the canonicity of certain works in Shakespeare. For example, if you say Shakespeare did not write those sonnets which passed for his, that would constitute a significant change and affect the manner in which the author's name functions. If we prove that Shakespeare actually wrote the works of Bacon, that would do the same thing. Therefore, to say that Pierre Dupont does not exist is not at all the same as saying that Homer didn't exist. If you say the first, you mean that there's nobody named Pierre Dupont. But if you do the second, you mean that maybe several people were mixed, maybe a tradition over many years existed of lots of different people passing on a tradition that now we call Homer, but it wasn't one author who existed. That's the difference. And therefore, you could say that the author is more of something like an author function uh, that characterizes a certain mode of being of discourse. A certain number of discourses, some are, some are not, are endowed with the author function. For example, an email, to use a modern parlance. Not every email that makes it into your inbox has an author, right? But certain types of discourse do, and therefore, rather than simply pronounce the death of the author, he wants to examine the way that what you really mean when you talk about an author is something like a modality of discourse, and later on, a certain modality related to the, to the circulation appropriation of discourses.
therefore, he wants to examine a sort of historical development of ways that um, authors came to be something one was concerned with. For example, in the past, authorship really was a byproduct of concerns of blasphemy. The need to pin a certain discourse down to a person out there in the world who said it was based on policing discourses that were considered problematic. If somebody said something that the state deemed illegal, they had to know who said it. Also, excuse me, there was a strange reversal in which in the olden times, Literary texts didn't need authors. The idea that they were archaic or ancient was in itself enough to bestow on them the same level of dignity which today we give to a work that definitely has an author. Um, and in fact, the retention of the Old Testament in the um, early days of Christianity was largely based on how old it was. There were lots of early Christian theologians who had reservations about the identity of content between the the Old and the New Testaments, but in the ancient Roman era, um, be, to be taken seriously as a religion, you had to establish a lineage going very far back, and that was w one of the reasons why the Old Testament was retained by some thinkers in early Christianity. And the same went for um, literary works. Homer um, is um, really old and uh, that's part of why we should consider it a classic, obviously not the only reason, but um, in the olden times, uh, scientific discourses were the opposite. In fact, scientific discourses at that time, often in the Middle Ages, relied on the formula, Hippocrates said, plenty recounts, etc. But a strange reversal occurred in the 17th century. Now, suddenly, Literary texts relied on being pinned down to an author, whereas scientific discourse started to become more and more anonymous. If you look at scientific writing courses, oftentimes they teach you to do the opposite of what a literary writing course or a basic composition course would teach you to do. Um, you're told not to write in the passive voice in a normal composition course, but if you're in a scientific writing course, you're told to put it in the passive voice. Experiments were done. You don't say by who because that's not the, the, the point. Um, research has concluded. Well, whose research? Um, even citing an author goes against convention. I remember taking biology in undergrad and having to write a paper of some sort, and the uh, professor corrected me that you, you don't use authors' names. You use dates of publication. That's the difference between who wrote it versus how relevant is it. Okay, And the... Criteria for determining is exactly who an author is actually owed quite a bit, was directly derived, he says, from the manner in which Christian tradition authenticated or rejected texts at its disposal. If you look at the history of early Christianity, many gospels circulating that were, some were deemed um, canonical, some were deemed not canonical. They had to have certain criteria for determining, for example, there was a bishop in the Middle East who was told that some of his parishioners were reading the Gospel of Peter. And he was asked if that was okay. His first response was, of course, that's perfectly fine. If it's the Gospel of Peter, that means it was written by an eyewitness account, actually, of the closest, you could debate, disciple to Jesus. When he saw the Gospel of Peter, which, if you haven't read it, that's a fascinating work, um, he looked at the content and said, um, actually, this is a forgery because there's certain... Um, doctrinal contents in the Gospel of Peter, which are alarmingly distinct from the quote-unquote truth. And the criteria by which certain texts were deemed forgeries and others deemed not forgeries follow a certain formula which St. Jerome um, solidified, which is you can tell whether something was an authentic Gospel, for example, based on criteria of value. If it's simply of inferior quality, you know it's false. Pastors will stay, say that to this day. You know that the Apocrypha, they say, is false because it's just simply not of the same quality of writing and content as the canonical biblical books. Um, there has to be soundness of doctrine. If the Gospel of Peter is teaching something which is 
more like a second century heresy, quote unquote, than something Jesus would have actually taught, or to put it in a more definite manner than what the other gospels say. The lack of soundness of doctrine rules it out as being part of the author's canon. There's also a, a consistency of style. And this is a criteria that modern scholars use to sort of distinguish whether um, certain books of Paul are really Pauline or if they were written as forgeries given the great stylistic variation from the canonical letters of Paul, like Romans versus Timothy, for example. Then you also have the historicity. If it's referencing events that happened well after the author's death that he could not have known about, you rely on the soundness of the author as a historical figure to provide the fourth criteria. So those all really ended up, tacitly or not, in our definition of the author, and the byproduct of that was the author served as a resolution of contradictions. If there are contradictions within the work, apparently a overall unity of writing would emerge through these four resolving criteria of soundness. However, he moves on to argue that um, there is a limitation to thinking, to using the word author only to talk about somebody who wrote a book, right? So obviously, um, Gustave Flaubert wrote some novels. He wrote some uh, books like Madame Bovary, etc. But what about this other type of author which appeared in the 19th century in Europe, which started something different that could still be considered a form of authorship? And he calls these, these people the founders of discursivity. Something different occurs with Freud and Marx, are the two examples he gives, than simply writing books. They make possible a certain type of discourse, which is uh, not so much imitated by others as it's continued by them. And he, he argues that that is different from founding a new genre of fiction. So he, he goes to Anne Radcliffe, who obviously wrote the first gothic horror novel, which other people obviously wrote, and there's certain motifs and, um, and plot devices, etc., which are the same. And he says, it's fair enough to say that after Anne Radcliffe, other people were able to write the genre of gothic horror novel by um, using the same themes, and yet that's not what he's saying about founders of discursivity, uh, founding genres like Marxism, genre is probably not the right word, but you know what I mean, um, Marxism psychoanalysis. It's not just replicating Freud or Marx, it's also providing theories that differ, right, provide di divergences. Is it really the case that Melanie Klein is simply um, rewriting the motifs of Freud? Is it, this, is it the case that Jacques Lacan is merely... Um, using the same motifs as Freud, or is it really that he's a significant figure precisely for the way that he provides divergences from Freud? And therefore, the idea of returning to the original becomes important. In the history of science, for example, um, out-of-date research is basically worthless. Now, you might have a little bit in your textbook about the history of um, of genetics, how it was um, devised with these experiments, but that's really just to provide a sort of educational story to introduce you to, okay, here's the current research. Um, obsolete knowledge is totally worthless, really, in, in that case, and yet um, going back to the original works of Freud, even after all of these de other developments, is considered super important because he's a founder of discursivity rather than just one sort of experimenter long, long ago. Um, here's the difference. Re-examination of Galileo's texts might well change our knowledge of the history of mechanics, and there are some people in, in, involved in the history of science. It's kind of a small field, but there are some people who do that. But it will never be able to change mechanics itself. On the other hand, re-examining Freud's texts modifies psychoanalysis itself just as re-examination of Marx would modify Marxism. Perhaps, therefore, it is time to study discourse not only in terms of their expressive value or formal transformations, but according to their modes of existence, the modes of circulation, valorization, attribution, and appropriation. And, in short, it is a matter of depriving the subject or substitute 
of its role as originator or analyzing the subject as a variable and complex function of discourse, not getting rid of the author, but understanding it according to the complexities of the author function and all of the subtle technicalities that go along with